when they asked me to give this lecture, uh, they, I got a little bit uh, worried because when I turned to my first uh, proposal, the committee said, that's a little too academic. Uh, maybe you can tell us first a general description of Buddhism, because people may not know that. So, of course, that's either very hard or very easy. <laughs> this case is pretty hard, so I will do my best to do a little bit of an introduction first and then go ahead and talk about Buddhism in this age. One of the things that's always interested me about Buddhism is the fact that it was probably, we could say, the first world religion. It was the first religion which broke out of its cultural, linguistic, geographic confines and spread far and wide. And it was a religion which did a very interesting thing in that it brought together from the old empires of South Asia and the Han Empire of China. Without the Buddhist tradition, those two cultures did not know each other, did not have contact, did not have translations, did not have an ability to understand what was happening. Buddhism was also a religion which spread into Central Asia, and it was that Central Asian area that allowed it to make this jump. So what I've tried to do is to, to say that Buddhism starts out very limited to the Ganges Basin. It was just the direct teacher, uh, teaching of one founder. And the question that I have worked with all my life, I think, is trying to understand why is it that this became a world religion? What was there in this tradition which allowed it to do this? And so when we look at how Buddhism spread and to all the areas of the world that it spread, I've continued to ask that question and I'll try to give you just a few possible solutions. I've been teaching long enough to know never to make a universal statement. <laughs> <laughs> if you make a universal statement, one counterexample and you're defeated. So I won't, I'll try to tell you Buddhism is multifaceted. Buddhism is not owned by anybody. Buddhism is, has spread far and wide in such a multiplicity of forms that it's very difficult sometimes to decide how can we index this religion. How can we write a metadata, as we say in the modern world, that fits this religion? It's very difficult. So as I said, it became the first. Because it spread, I would like to suggest that Buddhism did so because it has portable sanctity. Some religions have fixed sanctity. You can't get away from the homeland. You can't change the language. If you move about, you get ritually polluted. There are many issues which fix a religion in one place. So what was it in Buddhism that allowed it to have portable sanctity and to have it in spades? I mean, just to show you a little bit about how I've been trying to work with this. When I started working with the spread of Buddhism, I said, you know, you cannot write a book about this. It's impossible. You cannot give the complexity of the movement of this tradition in a book. Just, I tried, <laughs> failed, tried, failed. So that's when I formed the Electronic Cultural Atlas. I said, somehow or other, we have to put it into the new technology where we see it. We've got thousands of maps. We have thousands of images. And so here's the lights of the Earth. They're geo-registered to latitude-longitude. And I took the ancient trade routes and put them in latitude-longitude and laid them down on top of the ancient world, on top of the modern world. So the, the modern world are the lights. The ancient world of Buddhism are the lines. And the spread of Buddhism belongs in part of those lines. So in order to try to understand how Buddhism develop, as I said, I've been working with Korea for a lot of time, and what 
a lot of people don't know, I think, is that Buddhism moved from Korea to Japan, not from China to Japan. Korea was introduced to the Japanese by the Koreans. So I asked myself the question, if Buddhism is portable, one of the great portable moments was when it moved from Korea to Japan. How did they do it? Well, they sent four things. They sent monks, they sent texts, they sent bodily relics of venerated dead, and they sent images. And those four elements were the foundation, I think, of the portability of Buddhism. In this sense, relic veneration. The relics of esteemed dead is a tradition which I think the Buddhists really contributed to the West. It is no surprise that the first relics of the Christians were St. Thomas from India. That's where relics come from. <laughs> so the relic veneration of, of an esteemed dead who's not your relative has nothing to do with your family. That is a kind of portability because you then are going to go to some shrine where you will mix with strangers. They don't belong to your family. They come there for the same reason you do. So relics, which are produced by cremation, um, were used by the Buddhists to spread their tradition. Mostly, pollution fixes you. You worry about becoming polluted. Foreigners pollute you. Hinduism, you can't go across a big body of water if you're a priest and remain pit ritually pure. You go across the water, you're impure. Jain monks, you can't ride on a horse or ride on a vehicle. You cannot do that because it will ritually make you impure. Pollution fear is something that keeps us fixed. We fear others. We fear the strange. We fear the peculiar. The Buddhist had no fear of the greatest pollution of all, which is the dead. The dead is the greatest pollution that we face in life, the dead body. It's polluting in almost every culture. It creates problems ritually. So we are told that Chakyamuni went out to the charnel field where they tossed the corpses for exposure rather than burial and took the rags off of them and dressed himself. There was no pollution in the dead. That was a big issue. So when the Buddha passed away, his demise, he was cremated, his relics, that is his physical body, became the basis for the early Buddhist development. It was a relic cult first. And those relics were moved anywhere. And a relic carries its power with it. <clears throat> you don't have to have a sacred site to put a relic in. You got a relic, where you put it becomes sacred. And I think that this is uh, something which the Buddhist, as I said, they made it into a religious tradition and it spread into Syria and from there it spread into the Christian world. So the use of relics became a way for both Christianity and Buddhism to spread because you could take a relic and make a sacred site anywhere. You could go out in the middle of a desert. You could go out in the middle of a forest. You build a reliquary. You put the relic there. You got a holy site. So the cremation in Buddhism has remained very uh, significant. And if you want to trace where Buddhism existed, all you have to look for are signs of cremation. The Zoroastrians would never cremate. Cremation means that you would pollute fire. Death pollutes. You don't want to put fire because it's a basic element. So that the pollution of the dead means that all you have to do in Asia is look for cremation. Where you find it, the Buddhists were there, I guarantee you. Where you don't find it, the line had been drawn. So in a sense, East and West were separated by cremation and non-cremation. Cremation. So these relics after, a, a, like Korea, a holy monk is 
cremated, then what you do is you go through and look for the relics. That is, some kind of crystalline forms which remain after the body has been burned. And you count them. And the enlightenment of that person is determined by how many you find. I have a friend, his grandmother was cremated. She was a very good Buddhist, but he said, we just didn't realize how really holy she was until we counted her relics. She had more relics than any monk or nun you ever heard of. And suddenly she became much glorified in the family because of that. <laughs> Today, Buddhism still remains a reliquary religion. Whether you're in Mustang, in Nepal, whether you're in Bangkok, you're going to see the spires of the reliquaries. These are all reliquaries. Enormous reliquaries like this one in Kathmandu. Buddhism remains a relic cult in many ways, and the relic is extremely important. In Korea, some of the most beautiful reliquaries are in glass. You know, we talk about the Silk Road across Eurasia. Some people say we should call it the Glass Road. The Asians ship silk toward Rome, but the Mediterranean shipped glass to Asia because the Asians could make marbles, but they couldn't blow glass. They didn't have the technology to blow glass. So this glass is made in the Mediterranean, taken, but what do they use it for? They use it for relics. It is the most precious substance, and they put in it precious substances. The other thing are images. In the beginning, Buddhists didn't have images. Didn't need them. They had relics. If you got relics, you got the body of the person. Why would you want an image of them? You have their power in those relics. You wouldn't have that power in an image. So people just simply didn't have, have imagery when they were so focused on the bodily relic. However, when Buddhism began to spread, it came in contact with the Bactrian Greeks left there by Alexander and also left by the Parthians who employed Greeks to be their mercenary army. When Buddhism came in contact with the Greeks, one of the things that the Greeks gave the Buddhists was the Buddha image. Because the Greeks made portrait imagery of their kings and famous people. And they said, hey, if we're going to be Buddhist, we want portraits of the Buddha sculptural portraits, and they began to make them. And as you can see, they are real portraits. They are, look like people. Whereas in the background, you see how an image is where a face is made that's just generic. A lot of Buddhists do not make portraiture. They make generic face. This is a face. You draw a line this way. You draw a line that way. You put in the two eyes. You put in the nose. A little bit like a child drawing a face. It's just a generic face. So the Buddhists uh, were really influenced by the Greeks in this regard. And they made wonderful portrait images of the Buddha and Bodhisattvas in the form of Greek art. Now, it's provincial art. You go to Greece and you look at the Parthenon, or you go and look at it in its stolen form in, the, in Britain, and it's fantastic art. This is way out there in the provinces. They're still trying to do the same art, but it's very provincial. I love it. I think it's just fantastic art in Gandhara. So the Buddhists chose for the Buddhist figure, of all things, the Roman toga. They did not choose a Buddhist monastic robe for the Buddha images. They made them look like Greco-Roman art because that's what the Bactrian Greeks were accustomed to. So all I'm saying is that the Buddhist and Christian worlds and the Mediterranean worlds, they've been interchanging things for a long time. Asia and we, we think of Europe and Asia. I've stopped thinking that way. We should think Eurasia. Eurasia is much more realistic. So along the Silk Road, the Buddhists had to figure out a way to make their way through this terrain if they were going to spread. Mountains, high mountains, desert, driest on earth. Taklamakan, they say now it hasn't rained there for 800 years. 
the rain evaporates before it hits the ground. It's like Arizona, you know, you look up there and you see it's raining and there's nothing on the ground that's dry as dust. It evaporates before it hits the ground, of course. So on that Silk Road, the Buddhist learned how to make images and the first Buddha images were made in the image of Apollo. It was Apollo Buddha images. So we've borrowed from each other for a long time. We ought to recognize that as part of our heritage. It is our heritage. We, uh, we belong to all of this. Now images are sometimes fixed. The Black Madonna, for example, if you move a Black Madonna, usually she starts to weep. She does not want to be moved. And in fact, if you move a black Madonna, the chances are very good that the next morning she'll be back in her place. You don't move a black Madonna. In India, many of the images of the spirit are fixed to that place because that's where the spirit lives. And the image is a house for the spirit. So that's, in one sense, true idolatry. True idolatry means that you believe that the, the deity inhabits the physical image. Those are fixed. You can't move those around. The Buddhists had portable image. You could take it anywhere. You could take the relics anywhere. So then you have monastics. Uh, this is another contribution of Buddhism to the West. Under the Buddhists, they, they developed a thing which was called a monastery in our language with professional monks and nuns who shaved their heads lived by rule, wore special robes, were, took vows of poverty. All of that was fully in place long before Christianity. And when it spread across the Silk Road, I think this is one of Buddhism's great contributions to Christianity, were monks, nuns, and monasteries. And we're here on a campus. In a way, a campus grew, the university system grew out of monasteries in Europe. We are a kind of monastery in a campus after all. And I think that a campus is a Buddhist contribution. They are the ones who really invented this idea and spread it across the Silk Road. The monastics, however, have pollution issues and monastics sometimes were fixed. They had to be very careful about, in many cases, the idea of coming in contact with spirits, foreigners, aliens. So how do these monastics get across these deserts? How do, they, how do they make it and be able to build all these cities out there in Central Asia? Buddhism tried to fix their monasteries. They said to the monastics, you can't farm. You can't build a house. You have to beg every day for your food. You cannot store your food. Uh, these were the issues which they faced. So if you were like that, how are you going to travel? You have to have a lay person with you. You cannot travel without them. So the Buddhist picked merchants. Buddhism is a religion of merchants. It was merchants who carried them along the trade routes. It was merchants who used them, and what did they use them for? Well, they took these monks out there in the middle of the desert, they built them a little monastery, they put a relic in the monastery, they put images in that monastery, the monks set it up, it was a caravansary, it was a hospital, it was school, it was everything you have in a Persian caravansary. Uh, we ought to understand this because we have it here in California. The colonial missions that spread up our trade routes from San Diego to just beyond San Francisco with a monastery every day's travel is exactly what the Buddhists set up on the Silk Route. These are caravansary type monasteries spread and they are given power by a relic. Even these issues are so similar that we need to look at this cross-cultural
cultural issues again very carefully, I think. So the Buddhist monks came in contact with strange people in the drawings in Central Asia. We see people dressed every such way who were Buddhist. Everybody could be a Buddhist, and in this one, I love it, when the Buddha died, all the heretics rejoiced. So this is a party celebrating the death of the Buddha. At long last, we're finished with this guy. But there are all different types of people. They are all representing this. The other thing they said was the text. Texts become portable if you can translate them. If a text must, be re must remain in its original language, that fixes it to some degree. It fixes it to the community that can read and understand that particular language. The Buddha said, what is the teaching? The teaching is to be able to say what the case is. What is really the case? What is the world like? That's all you have to say in the teaching. You have to tell it like it is. So the Buddha is attributed with the saying, if the Dharma, if the teaching is to, to describe things as they really are, you ought to be able to say that in any language, anywhere, anytime. There's nothing special about that in terms of language. So the Buddhist texts were translated into Tibetan, into Chinese, into Sogdian. They were put on palm leaves. They were put on birch bark manuscripts. Uh, we're still unfurling the birch bark manuscripts, as you can see. The only way to unfurl and deal with some of those manuscripts is to use the technology of brain surgery. You have to take it into the operating room with all the instruments to, uh, to unroll one of these things. Uh, Buddhism allowed for printing. The first really huge printing project in the world was the Buddhist canon in the northern Song Dynasty of China. 130,000 printing plates were carved. Their canon is the largest in the world still. If you took the Chinese Buddhist canon, it would be about 10 sets of the Encyclopedia Britannica if translated into English. That's because not only is the original portable, but the doctrine itself if, can be said by anybody. Well said, it's the Dharma. <laughs> if you tell it like it is, that's the Dharma. So. Their texts have grown in size and will continue, and it's still an open canon. So now we come to our global age, and I've asked myself the question. In the past, their texts were portable, their people were portable, their relics were portable, their images were portable, but what makes Buddhism portable in today's world? Why is it that people are attracted to Buddhism in a global age of technology? Buddhism is suddenly having an enormous revival in Asia. Uh, I can tell you that from going to Vietnam, I've been over there and I was staying in one of the monasteries and it was Ancestor Day and everybody was there to light incense. I couldn't get into the place. I lived there and I couldn't get through. It took hours for me to wait for the thousands of people to leave. So why is it? What makes it still portable in today's world? Well, um, first of all, I think that its texts can be put on the internet, and they are. They can be put on a CD-ROM. I put help put the Korean canon on CD-ROM. It's 52 million characters. It took us 10 years to do it. Uh, when we finished it, they had a big celebration in Korea in the Olympic basketball stadium filled with people who came to witness this. And then they came carrying this large crystal stupa form. Six monks carrying it, very heavy. And what's in it? The CD-ROM. <laughs> They have made it a spiritual object. So Buddhism can spread to a CD-ROM as well as a manuscript or printing. It's still portable, even in our age. 
But I think the thing that makes Buddhism perhaps the most available to the present day world is the fact that it has some very unique features in its teachings. One of them is, it's the only religion that I know of that spends an enormous amount of time in its scripture talking about what? Talking about how we see the world, physically. I mean, they're talking about the eye sending an impulse to the brain and the brain processing that impulse. That's why tomorrow I want to talk about cognitive science and the Buddhist. What religion would say this is the beginning of enlightenment is to understand how your senses work physically. If you don't know how your senses work physically and you don't know how the brain is working, then you don't have chance. I mean, they're very open about it. So consequently, almost every time they open their mouth, the first thing they did is say, well, there's the eye, the ear, the nose, and there's the sense feels for them, and there's a consciousness that results from them. So perception became a big issue. And then the question is, of course, from them, was to say, you know, people accuse them of saying that there's no external world or it's illusory and all that. Buddhists never deny the external world. Never, I guarantee you. They never dis deny the external world. But what they say is, you will never see it. You will never see it directly. All you can experience is the brain, chemical, electrical reactions to the data that comes from the senses, and that is all human experience is. You don't have it. We don't have the ability to go beyond that. So the illusion is not the external world. The illusion is our brain creates for us virtual reality, and it does it so well that, by golly, you really, it really looks like you're there. You know? If I didn't know better, I would think that this is a room full of people. So this cognition process for the Buddhist was exactly what I think what cognitive science says today. You have an external, it, light reflects off the eye, the eye sends an electrical impulse to the brain, the brain processes it in some way, and you have consciousness and say, I see you. Of course, I don't see you. I see that electrical impulse in here. That's the illusion. The illusion is, I see you out there. The reality, say the Buddhists, is we have to accept that I, whoever I am, see you, whoever you are, in here. Today in the world, what used to be private is now public. It used to be that I could say, I don't know what you're thinking. I don't know what's going on in your brain. Guess what? More and more, I can know what's going on in your brain. I can hook you up to the machines. I can see the pattern of brain activity, the electricity, the flow of blood. I can see all of that. And I know pretty much that, ha you just saw something because that part of your brain lit up. I know you saw it. Don't tell me you didn't. So what was once private is becoming more public. What is consciousness? Still a big question. Is it this moment where the nerves in the brain drop the little chemical from one to the side to the other? Is that consciousness? The Buddhists spent a lot of time thinking about this. If we don't know what's happening to us, then we don't know things as they really are. And how do we know things as they really are? We have to know our perceptions and how they come to us. So today, uh, recently there was a conference on consciousness in Washington. They invited the Dalai Lama. He went. The scientists said to the Dalai Lama, we really like to test these meditators, but we don't want just, you know, your grassroots meditator, somebody who's out here. We want the best. And you must have them. Will you let us test them? Dalai Lama said, sure. Happy to. 
The meditators weren't too happy, <laughs> but he said, you're going to have to let them test you. You're going to have to meditate while you're hooked up with respirators, with all of this gear. So this is one of them that's being done at Harvard. Uh, NIH is now funding this kind of support for this, this kind of issues in which we are trying to understand what is it that happens when somebody meditates because it now appears that concentration and mindfulness make an enormous difference in the way in which we live our lives, in which we learn, and how we handle life's situation. And it, we need to know more about it. Our senses, of course, can give us pain. And so we say, I cut my finger. And the Buddhists keep saying, you understand that it's not your finger that hurts. But that's really, it's your brain that's hurting. Your brain tells you, ouch. And I, then I, I say, oh, it's my finger. In Vietnam today, one of the most moving things for them is, is the fact that a Vietnamese monk during the Vietnamese War burned himself without showing any signs of pain. I don't know if you've ever seen the video of him burning, but it is incredible. He burned sitting in his lotus posture with his mudra for three minutes before he fell over. How did he do it? How could somebody, because other people tried it thereafter. A lot of people burn themselves, you know, they, they commit suicide and they scream and writhe in pain. They should never do it. <laughs> you know, they don't know how to do it. They haven't yet, they don't have the right to do that. He, un, he could turn off the brain and the pain sensor in his brain. He could turn it off, undoubtedly. So somebody has said he could be fire if he had ever thought I am on fire, he would have hurt. Being fire was not the pain, it was the consciousness that I'm on fire. So the teachings uh, of the Buddhists are in contrast to its practices in some sense. Practice or such things as meditation. Meditation can obviously go very deep. We can modulate our sensory material, we can probably even modulate the structure of our brain. That's what they're trying to explore. Is that possible to do that? The teachings of Buddhism are, are, are very often connected with causality. You know, cause is one of the great crises of our time. We have two big crises in my estimation. One of them is cosmology and the other is causation. What is cause? Is it a force or is it a concept? That's the big question that we try to answer. The Buddhists have many, many statements about causality. They don't all agree with one another. So I'm not trying to present that there's one big thing. But for example, we in this country are faced with a big problem in our public school system and in our political system with the issue of first cause. What caused this world? And we've got the whole issue of evolution and intelligent design before us. It's not just a, a religious issue, it's a big political issue, it's a cultural issue, it's a social issue. We face it in our schools. We face it in all that we do. And I decided that it's probably become, the best thing I can say is that when it gets into cartoons, you know it's right in the middle of our social life. And so intelligent design in terms of what a lot of people now begin to look at is to say it's really hard to get the reality of the world and its creations into the intelligent design box. It just won't fit very easily. Einstein, of course, 
poor Einstein, you know, he really wanted a general theory. He really wanted to unite the quantum level with the molecular level. He said there must be a law which operates in both. How can we have laws which, di which discohere? You move from the molecular to the quantum, and all the rules of the molecular world discohere. You move from the quantum to the molecular, and all the quantum theories discohere. He hated it. He hated it. He said, how could God do this? You've got to have, obviously, we don't understand it. He felt that you have to have a notion of God. He really did. Einstein really wanted that. But the Buddhists, in terms of their causation, say, you're never going to get it. That's what they say. I'm just a reporter here. <laughs> I'm not an enlightened person, so I don't know. But the Buddhists say this. They had a creation idea in India, Ishvara. Ishvara created the world. So the Buddhists said, well, that's a big thing to do. Pretty nice. Create a cosmos. But everything has a cause. And if you don't believe that, you can't talk to the Buddhists. Everything has a cause. So they said, the cause of Ishvara would be greater than Ishvara himself. Let's worship the cause of Ishvara. But then there's the cause of the cause of the cause of the cause of, and you can never reach the end of it. So the Buddha said, you will never find first cause. You will never find an uncaused effect. And that's why they are considered to be atheistic. He said, you just can't get there. And it's not worth your while to even try, because you're not going to make it. They also said that causality is like a chain. It's links. And those links can cause all kinds of pain and suffering and struggle. And you can have a chain reaction accident. You know, here in California, we're always having them. And the only way to do it is you have to break the chain of causation in that sense. But that's just one of their ideas of causation, that it's a chain of events. In another way, they were like Hume. They said, you infer that if there's smoke on the mountain, there's fire there, because you've seen smoke and fire in the kitchen. So you can infer it. But of course, we know that things that stand together are not causal necessarily. You know, the rooster crows every morning before sunup. So you, would you say, aha, I've got the cause of sunrise. It's the rooster crowing, because it always occurs before the sunrise. So therefore, it must cause it. Relation does not mean causality. Cause, says Pearl at UCLA, cause is the greatest mystery of our time. We simply do not understand causality. And when we do, we get Simpson's paradox. Simpson's paradox is you get two things that stand together. And it's like when people said, to the joy of many of us, if men who drink red wine live longer, hooray, down to the wine shop immediately to buy red wine, right? Then somebody comes along and says, no, no. Men who drink red wine are richer, have a better diet, and better health care. That's why they live longer. It ain't the wine. In fact, people who, men who are richer, have better health care, have better diet, who don't drink wine live longer than those who do drink wine in that group. In other words, Simpson's paradox says you add a third element and you'll get the opposite result. It's like the one that uh, Pearl uses at UCLA. He said, boys who smoke get higher grades. Boys whose mothers smoke get lower grades. You add the other element, and you get a complete reversal. Because standing together doesn't mean a lot. So I've tried to think about Buddhist karma. Am I just a prisoner of karma? My past is affecting me and creating. So I've, I've thought, in one way, karma is like cellular automata. 
That is, you start out with some dots, you have a rule, the dots follow that rule, and you have all kinds of patterns that begin to emerge. And um, this is cellular automata. You can have beautiful designs that emerge because you say, where you have a black one in the next line, make it white. Where you have two blacks, make it two whites. You write all these rules, and a man named Wolfram, who invented the wonderful software called Mathematica, Wolfram has run cellular automata through his computers for something like 12 million times, and he comes up with swirls and tree forms, and he says the whole world is just made up of cellular automata. We have rules. The rules are being observed. They are slowly emerging. Karma is a little bit like cellular automata. You do something, and the rule says you've started something, you've set it in motion, and you'll get a result, and that result will be, you would think, predictable, wouldn't you? Cellular automata, like Rule 123, you cannot predict. Isn't that interesting? You got a rule, and you can't predict what it's going to produce for you. So here you've got three different things. They all started off with the same dots. Just change the rule, and what do you get? Very great differences. So in one way, the karmic causal relationship in Buddhism was to say, yeah, you do something, and it sets in motion kind of natural laws, and certain things will result. But you can't really predict what they're going to do because it's one to many. You can't predict. The Buddhists, I think, have also said that, and this is something which we're just now beginning to deal with, they have said it's endlessness that we live in. Endlessness. And we're only beginning to understand what endlessness would really mean. If you write an algorithm for endlessness, anything is possible up to like 99.8%. <laughs> That's why they talk about parallel universes. In endlessness, 50 trillion billion years of activity, the mathematical probability that you will get a repeat is very high. So, when you deal with endlessness, it's another issue. You're into a different world in one way. But that's the world that we face. So the Buddhists love to use the Hall of Mirrors. They love fractals. They loved all of that complexity to say, this is really what, what it's like. It's multitudinous. It's reflective. It's like endless mirrors. We are dealing in a world in which we are trying to figure out what causes what. So if you get endless mirrors, which one causes which? How do you deal with causality when you've got this kind of issue? So the Buddhists came up with the idea that what we have is interactive causality. Each crystal reflects all others and is in turn reflected by them. That is, we live in a holographic world. And this world that's holographic is that we are in a situation where the Buddhists say we have multiverses. Buddhists were talking about multiverses over 2,000 years ago. We're now beginning to face it. Do we have a universe? Or do we have a multiverse? Do we just have this Big Bang universe of ours? So one of the issues which the Buddhists have always said about endlessness is, if you want to make patterns and you want to make predictions, you got to draw a box and put your data in that box. Because you can't make a true pattern unless you have all the data contained therein. You can't have a software written that isn't larger than the data. If you've got endlessness, you can never know the pattern. You never can know it. So the Buddhists um, had their cosmology, and their cosmology was this. 
we in the West have fought with whether or not the Earth is the center of the universe, whether the sun is the center. Uh, the Big Bang and going out there to the cosmos. The Buddhists say this. There are multiverses. They recognize that. They say this is just one. This universe is contained inside another one. And it's so big we'll never see it. We'll never even know it's there. We're like an atom and a grain of sand on the beach of that bigger universe which encapsulates us. And there's one that encapsulates it, and one that encapsulates it. And so when you say large and small, what do you mean? Large with regard to all of it? Am I large in terms of this little ant on the floor? What is large? What is small? These are all relative terms. They're just convention. We just have to have something to live with. So the Buddhists say, yes, you can do that. But you have to understand that we live in a continuum that we do not know where to cut off and draw a pattern from it. Now, does that leave us Buddhist in a situation which a lot of people feel our modern age of cosmology and causality is leading us, where we will have only relativity, we will have no way to, to determine our ethics and morals, we'll have no way to decide how to live because we have done away with any idea of centrality, we have put ourselves in this situation of a continuum that's endless. And I think that Buddhism is portable in the modern world because it says, first of all, we've lived for over 2,000 years without any idea of a first cause. And we've had ethics, we've had morals, we've lived a good life, we've enjoyed it. We've had the idea that we are just in a continuum of multiverses, but we've had morals, we've had ethics, we've had a good life. We probably really need to hear what the Buddhists have to say in a global age of technology to say to us that if we are fearful of relativity and we are fearful of multiverses, and we are fearful of the fact that we just can't tie causality down and make sense out of it, that we then are going to be left bereft, chaotic, without anything to live by. Here's a religion that says yes, and how do you do that? And basically, this is their answer. We are in this room. If we tried to write the history of why we're here and the history of everybody in this room and how you came to be here tonight, we'd never reach the end of it. We'd be writing for centuries, tracing every single thing. And if we said, why are we here? We're here because of the Big Bang. We're here because our parents saw each other and got married. We're here for because I got in the car and drove here. But you can never fully get the whole history of the cause for this event. But the Buddhists say there's one thing you should know, and it's crucial. We are here. Whether we know the history of it, we must always be aware of the moment because it's that moment that is the magic and the secret of life. This moment is sufficient. Whatever causes to be here, it happened. We know that. We are here. And that's why the Buddhists keep saying, if you're somebody who's hit by an arrow, you're not going to stand around and say, wait, before you remove that arrow, doctor, now tell me what kind of wood it's made from 
and who made it and how did it get shot from the bow and no you say the sufficiency of the moment is I got an arrow in me and for God's sake pull it out that's what we want so for the Buddhist and for meditation and why do you meditate and why do you try to and how do you live in this world of complexity and chaos and inability to to pattern it understand that the moment you return to the present this moment you're centered this moment for the Buddhist then becomes the sacred moment it's that moment of complete sufficiency nothing else was needed whatever it was it's been done and what was done is already passed I know that so I feel that the Buddhists have a lot to say about the modern age I think they have a lot to say in our age of technology I think they have a lot to say in terms of how to handle this complexity in which we live and their teaching is very simple perception causality and the fact that we live in a multiverse of cosmoses that's our state but so is this one so thank you Um, I actually have two questions here. The first one is um, whether you had read the book by the um, Dalai Lama. I think he had co-authored it. Um, I think it's called The Universe in a Single Atom, which kind of blends mm -hmm. a lot of these science, um, yeah. the discoveries in science over the last hundred years with Buddhist thought, specifically with the nature of reality, emptiness, etc. And my second question is, um, I think it's a wonderful gift all the work that you've done. I, I didn't know who you were, who you were before I came here. But um, in terms of putting Buddhist scripture um, into a form that is accessible, my question then is, um, how does that interact with the need for communities of people to study Buddhism, um, interact with it, um, have some kind of um, community in which to learn mm -hmm. Buddhist text, have a teacher, etc.? Um, I, I've not read that particular book by the Dalai Lama. I've heard the title. I have, I admit to you, I have not read it. Um, but I'm sure probably it said some of those things similar to what I said tonight. With regard to the, to the role of digital work, in 1988 I was sitting on my deck. I, I live at the beach up in Northern California. I was sitting on my deck and enjoying life. And then the thought came to me, my karma is to be born in the digital age. That's my karma, and that's your karma. It's all of our karma. And I suddenly said to myself, I don't want to miss it. This is, this is a turning point in human history. This is equal to the invention of writing, the invention of printing, the invention of paper, and this is it. And I had an experience. Um, I helped a project where we put into the internet uh, historical maps of Japan. And We'd had that collection, 400-year-old maps, really paintings from Japan at Berkeley for 50 years. During 50 years of time, 25 people registered to use that collection. When we put it on the internet, um, it helped that the New York Times made it a front page story, but when we put it on the internet, <laughs> We had 27,000 hits in the first 24 hours. And since then, we have had over 2 million hits. Nobody can stay outside of this media. 
This, if Buddhism is to be a portable religion in our time, it's got to be there. And it is. The Buddhists are ahead of almost everybody else in many ways. If you go in and you put in Zen, you'll get more hits than you'll get if you put in church. <laughs> it's amazing, isn't it? So I, I firmly want to sh sh allow people to have access. Uh, the, we put our material online. I insist that everything I do is made free. I do not believe in putting barriers between ourselves and what's in the Internet. I have decided that as a professor, I have been paid to do my research by the people of California and from my federal grants from the people of the United States. And I firmly believe that everything I produce, as well as everything that every other professor produces under such circumstances, should be made free without intellectual property copyright and made available to the world. I feel that very strongly.